the seats.
and they sing it right with me. They still have it down. Even though they forgot their own names, forgot the kids' names, everything, they still got the spirituality deep down in them in the heart right there somewhere. It's beautiful. Before I forget, I got a couple other prayer requests. If I don't write them down, I'll forget to pray for them here for later. Singing, and I thought I'm not supposed to be thinking about things. I got to keep my mind focused. <laughs> All right, but we're talking about Job 26 today, okay? And in Job 26, oh, I forgot to bring the Augustine story with me, and I printed it out. But I have it in my head pretty good. Let me tell it to you. Augustine was a great fellow. He was around the year 400. Pretty much a lot of our modern theology right now came from Augustine. All right, you know, he was a Catholic fellow, but I don't know how the Catholics <coughs> negotiate a lot of things that he said because he was a guy that really did lean on uh, salvation by faith alone, justification by faith alone, grace alone. And one day he was pondering, he was, uh, he, he <coughs> saw a little boy, and well, he was pondering the Trinity, and he couldn't figure out the Trinity, and at the time he didn't necessarily believe in the Trinity. You know, it was on his faith journey as he was growing. And he saw a little boy, and he was by the side of the ocean. And at the side of the ocean, this little boy has a little tiny seashell with a hole in it. And he's pouring water through the seashell from one side to the other. And he says to the little boy, what are you doing out here? And he goes, I'm going to pour this entire ocean through this seashell right here. And he thought, that's crazy. That little guy's never going to be able to do all that and pour it all through. But then he thought about, too, he thought about the craziness of a lot of things that we just do not understand. And just because we don't understand something doesn't mean that it's not the way that it is. You know, not, not the way it is. He thought that's how he came to his conclusion on the Trinity. Even though he cannot understand the Trinity, it's, you know, the Bible alludes to it all over the place. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, three separate, three separate persons in one Godhead. So he had to just trust it and accept that there's a lot of things that are beyond our comprehension, that are mysteries, that we won't ever grab all the way around. And that kind of fits well with how this goes today with Job 26, as he answers all of his friends back and all of their speeches are done. But some other things about this is it's Job's harshest rejection of his friend's counsel. So Job's really going to let him have it. Sarcasm's going to fly hard, okay, in the first few verses of his friends. Uh, Job rejects Bill that is unhelpful and without insight. That's what he's going to tell his friend. And Job recognizes the infinite knowledge of God. He recognizes the overwhelming power of God. And he realizes that humans can understand only a portion of God's ways. You know, we just, we're not God ourselves. I always say, that if we could understand everything in the Bible and have it down picture perfect, then it would be obvious that man created the Bible, that man created religion, that's all just a made-up fairy tale, because if we made it up, then we could make ourselves understand it. But we didn't make it up, and it's something that was given to us direct by God, and there's deep mysteries that are tough. And like our buddy Tony says sometimes in Bible study, he says, Deuteronomy 29.29, it says the secret things belong to the Lord. You know, there's great mysteries that belong to God that sometimes we don't understand. And I wrote here, he prays to God, he speaks to God. It's talking about Job. He complains to God, he fights with God, but all his friends did was speak about God. And that was what the difference is. And that should be the difference in our lives too. It shouldn't be that we just 
speak about God. You know, as we go through life and we do life, we're going to run into problems and issues. We should be praying all the time. We should be speaking to God. At times, we it's okay to complain to God, okay? It's totally okay. If you read a third of the Psalms, the psalmist is complaining to God. You know, if you read the book of Lamentations, there's a lot of lamenting and complaining to God. Read Jeremiah, the weeping prophet. You know, read Isaiah. Isaiah was called by God, this great job he's going to do, and then you know what God told him, and no one's going to listen to you because I've made their ears deaf, and I've made it so they can't see and they can't understand. But this is what you're going to do. And this is how he spent his whole life, you know, speaking to a people who would not hear. And, and, uh, but the difference was, was you brought it to God. Uh, and then I wrote about human religion and philosophy have never had power to save. Only the message of the cross with undeserved suffering, unmerited grace, has power to help the helpless. There's no human religion, no philosophy, nothing that has the power to save. Only the message of the cross. One of these commentaries I'm reading, I think the best one that I'm reading, the guy that knows the most about the book of Job that I found, is a guy named Christopher Ash. He's from England. And he has a commentary, and it's called The Wisdom of the Cross. That's what it's called for the whole book of Job. You know, the cross wasn't around the book of Job. But yet, this is what Job is getting toward. You know, one thing you can see is Job's friends' theology never changed. They were all in the system. You do good, you get good. You do bad, you get bad. Job, you must have done bad because you're getting all this bad. And they never fluctuated. They never changed. They were stuck in a box. Job, on the other hand has changed quite a bit as we've been following him through these things, okay? He's cried out to God. He's complained. He's questioned God. He's, he's wanted a trial because he knows he's just and he doesn't understand what's going on, but yet he's always praying and going toward God. And we're going to see some tremendous change that Job has come about today as he speaks these, uh, these truths and things. And I, I seen this movie yesterday. It's a three-hour movie, so I only saw an hour and a half because it was late. And I was getting tired. <laughs> But I'm going to watch more of it. But if you remember a while back, I handed out this movie called The American Gospel. All right? There's been a sequel that just came out last week. And it's part two, and it's called Christ Crucified. I like it so much, I, I, I looked them up on Facebook. I even Facebook friended the fellows that talked down there. I don't know if they'll Facebook friend me back. <laughs> but I thought, what a bunch of great fellows and what they've done this message. And as I'm watching it, they show what they call the emerging church, and then also what there's a podcast called the Deconstructionist. And those are two terrible things. Don't write that down to look them up unless you write it down to let you know, stay away, okay? But deconstructionism is a theological term in the books, and what it means is that all historical Christianity, that you're questioning all of it and making it something new. And that's what the emerging church is also doing. And the emerging church is very, you won't hear the word deconstruction too often, because that's like a book theological term, but you will hear the term emerging church quite a bit, because there's a lot of giant churches that are going over to the emerging church method, where everybody just kind of questions and figures it out for themselves, and if they all come out with different answers, that's okay. But there is trouble with that, because it's one word of God right here, one truth. We cannot question the Bible. The Bible has got to be completely authoritative. If we question the Bible, how much more can we question? Then we are left out just the same as a lost folk is, just the same as a person looking for human religion and philosophy, totally hopeless, okay? I always tell folks to question everything, and I mean that. But I hope you don't ever take me to be like an emerging church or deconstructionist because I want you to question things. I want you to find the answers in the Word of God and to be very well based and have your own faith and own it from what the Bible says, not from what you just made up or just happens to be a good thought in your mind or somebody else grabbed it and it contradicts what the Word of God said. And they show guys that are professionals in this business of speaking like that, and there's some giant Bible names, like they got a guy whose name was Steve Campolo, and he has son Tony Campolo, and he is completely, doesn't even call himself Christian now, calls himself a secular humanist, and how it went from Christianity to madness, and they show Rob Bell all the time in there. Rob Bell at one time was a preacher that everybody liked at Mars Hill Church, 
And then he wrote a book called Love Wins, where he said, no longer does hell exist, everybody's going to go to heaven, and it's really Unitarian Universalism, and he questions everything and does not hold the Bible as authoritative. And it shows in the American Gospel, I, th I love the way, that, who, I don't know who masterminded this movie, but I'm going to get in your hands and hopefully you can find three hours. But it will keep you in those three hours. They kept me an hour and a half here. I said, no, i got to go to bed and I'll watch the rest later. But uh, it's got some solid stuff in there and it shows how our culture is changing and how the philosophy of the culture changes. But truly, if you're smart enough, you can look to see that it's changed before. It's not the first time cultures ever changed. Many cultures have changed in the midst of human time. And we can see what it adds up to, a whole bunch of nothingness. nothingness. It doesn't go anywhere. The only hope we have in life is Jesus Christ and the cross that he died on. Took that undeserved suffering, unmerited grace. It's not some treasury of merit that we're working on to get off of somebody else's good graces that we're going to be okay. It's that God gave us this grace even though we did not deserve it whatsoever. He loved us so much, he gave us Jesus Christ on the cross. And this is what we're going to see Job come down to the picture as he's been talking with his friends. Job 26, verse 1 and 2 says, <clears throat> Job responded, What a help you are to the weak, how you have saved the arm without strength. Now, this is really... Really a, a, a sarcastic insult to build at, okay? And the other friends that are sitting there. He's saying, what a help you are to the weak. Like, you sure have helped the weakling. You know, you think I'm a weakling. You are such a help to this weakling right here. He's like saying, absolutely not. You're good for nothing. You are just worthless, you friends of mine. You haven't helped this me and my weakness whatsoever. He's saying, how you saved the arm without strength. You know, here's a fellow that doesn't have any strength at all. Oh, how you've come along and saved me. They basically told him that because of his sins, God had to kill all ten of his children. Because of his sins, he is where he is. Because of all this stuff, because of this, you are worthless, Job. They even told him, you don't even have a chance to repent. You're going to go to hell, Job. You don't even have any chance anymore. This is what his friends have told him. So things have built up now, and he's letting them have it. All right? And he lets him know, what a help you are to the weak. And he's being very sarcastic. He says, what counsel you have given to one without wisdom. As if, you know, as if Job was someone that didn't know anything. And he's like, what wonderful things you've told me. That you've tried to teach me. And they weren't wonderful things. They were terrible things. They were trying to put it in basically the health, wealth, prosperity gospel picture that's prevalent and so popular today on the television. That if you do good, you get good. If you do bad, you get bad. And Job, since you're getting bad, you must be bad. That's what they gave him. And it wasn't any good to him. What helpful insight you have abundantly provided, he said. So he's saying that my friends have contributed nothing. They have had no wise counsel whatsoever. Then he goes on to say, to whom have you uttered words? And whose spirit was expressed through you? So now he's referring as if maybe the devil has spoken through them. He's saying, what kind of a spirit is spoken through you? It's not, he's saying, I think it's definitely not the Holy Spirit of God. You know, who, who's, where are these words coming from? What is, where is this coming from, from you? So he's telling them, and it said in Job 4.15 as well too, that they spoke with an evil spirit, is what he's basically letting his friends know. I'm sure his friends are furious by now. You know, because they're stuck and they seem like they tried to do good by him there. But they did it. But one thing that's different is they never fluctuated. They stayed in that same box. And this was something new in life. I mean, this was a tremendously horrible thing that happened to a man who loved God with all of his heart. All his heart, mind, and soul. Job was sold out for Jesus. And how do we know that? It's not that we just suppose it. It's because the Bible tells us so three times in those first two chapters. So now it says, this is like a hymn that Job makes for the rest of these verses from 5 to 14. The departed spirits tremble under the waters in their inhabitants. Naked is Sheol before him, and a bad end has no covering. So when I read this version, it was a little more modern. It got, made this a little bit easier to understand. But these are like three things about death is what he's talking about. And he's saying that they that death can't even run away from God. That God is there in hell. God is there controlling everything. There is nothing that can run from God. If you read 
Revelation chapter 6, verse 15 to 17. I'm going to read it to you because I thought, I thought it was really something when I read it. This is talking about the end times. You know, times that haven't happened yet. But Revelation 6, 15 to 17 lines up well with this verse right here. It says, <clears throat> this is talking about when God's wrath and judgment are coming on the earth. It says, then the kings of the earth, the nobles, the generals, the rich, the powerful, and every slave and free person hid in the caves and among the rocks of the mountains. And they said to the mountains and to the rocks, Fall on us and hide us from the face of the one seated on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb, because the great day of their wrath has come, and who is able to stand? So even the greatest kings, the most powerful people on the earth, maybe today you think of maybe the president, you think of Putin, you think of all these big folks and fellas today, maybe the big Iranian mean fellas, all these guys, and they are shaken and hiding in the cave, saying God's wrath is upon us, hide us from it. We don't want to even be near God. We want to be far from God because his power has come down and his wrath is on us. And, uh, and that's what it's going to be one day, is what it says. And here it points out the Sheol, the grave is naked before him, abandoned has no covering, like hell has no covering whatsoever. It's all open before God. Nobody can run from God. No one can escape from God. God has complete mastery over the realm of the dead. It's not that people die and then God's like, oh, you know, I, I, I always used to hear this. And the more I study scriptures, the more I find that it's not true. It's hell is not hell because it's the separation of the presence of God. If you look in Revelation 14, God is there causing the torture in hell, causing the wrath and the pain and all these things going on in hell. There is no place that exists that God is not. That's one thing we believe about God. He's omnipresent. He's everywhere all the time. There's not a place we're away from Him. He is everywhere. For the believer, that should cause us the greatest comfort in the world because we know God is in control. We know that God loves us. We know that He works all things together for the good to those who love Him. It should cause us great peace. For the unbeliever, it should cause them great fear because it's not, it's not just being separated from God and now you're on your own to fend for yourself. It's the wrath of God, the anger of God, the Almighty who can create and make all the stars, the moon, the sun, do all these things, and He can also cause an anger and a wrath and a punishment and a suffering beyond our deepest imaginations. And he's pointing out that, that God is in charge of all this. Don't think that God's not here, God's not there. Don't think God's not with me while I'm suffering right here and right now. He says, he stretches out the north over empty space and hangs the earth on nothing. He wraps up the waters in his clouds and the cloud does not burst under them. So now we're talking a lot of symbolic talk uh, I don't have all, the, if you guys are into mythology, you would know the words better than me maybe, but I think it's Ugaritic, the uh, mythology was what was popular in this, uh, in this time long, long ago, and, and it's what the people talk. It's almost like you may think, well, how is mythology tied in with the Bible? It's because it was the, the, what was going on with the pagans in the day. You know, we talk about stuff all the time, how people understand things today. That's how they talked about things too, how people understood things in the day. You know, we talk about different churches. Uh, one thing I found out reading this study that I, I want to confirm, but it's, it's written by a scholar. It said the Hindus believe that the entire universe is on the back of an elephant who is standing on the back of a tortoise as the tortoise walks along. <laughs> and you can see how there's all these different fields of thoughts and philosophies and religions. But what we believe is Genesis 1.1. In the beginning, you know, God created the heavens and the earth in the beginning. That's what we believe. We believe that God made everything. God's totally in control. But that's not what everybody believes. And they now connect in the language that other people believed in those days. And also you have to think about they did not have contemporary science like we have it now. Okay? You know, I don't know. I saw one picture that I saw was the way that the science and they thought far ago in mankind that we could see is that the earth was flat, okay, the horizons where the ocean dropped off, that that was the end of the earth, there wasn't anything over there. And above the earth were the heavens, and that's where God dwelt. And below the earth was the underworld, 
And that's where the demons and the spirits and the darkness dwell. And that is, and below that was like where the, the suffering and hell and things like that were. And that's how they pictured life. So if you can kind of picture that, you can picture these words a little bit better as you read them. And in this north doesn't mean that like we can look at a compass and north and that's where I'm going to go to find God. It's north is in the symbolic picture like up. Up there is where God is to the north. So he says he stretches out the north over empty space. You know, they can see the space with the stars and the sun and the moon. He hangs the earth on nothing. He wraps up the waters in his clouds and the cloud does not burst under them. I mean, even this idea hangs the earth on nothing, even what they had, didn't have the modern science that we have, they saw the earth just hanging there, just hanging there. Like something was below the earth, something's above the earth, and we're just hanging there. Now we know like the earth is spinning and things like that, but still, how do we get to spin just the way we spin? How do we get to survive? How does the solar system and everything work its way around? We have science where we can study these kind of things and it fascinates us so we can see this is why this is happening. But we don't really know the why. We don't know what caused all these things to perfectly be just the way they are. We're really at as much of an unknownness as they're of an unknownness. We just know a few more details about stuff, okay? But, but it is fascinating as you think of that. He, he's trying to show the glory of God, the greatness of God, how great God is, how little man knows is what he's trying to get to here. And he points up, he wraps up the waters in his clouds, and the clouds do not burst under them. Think about this, even now, when there's a heavy rainstorm coming, and like inches and inches of rain or feet and feet of snow end up coming down, how is all that just floating around in the air up there? How does it not come down with the sense of gravity and things? I mean, just think about the wonders of creation, is what he's thinking about. Like, how amazing is this, that there's water hanging up there in the clouds that can be so much that a flood can happen when it all comes down just out of the cloud. And yet you can be in an airplane, just drive right through the cloud, and it's nothing. It's like, you know, it's just gone. It's white wisps. are all past you. So he's pointing out these amazing things. He obscures the face of the full moon and spreads his cloud over it. He has inscribed a circle on the surface of the waters at the boundary of light and darkness. Now, inscribed a circle... You can think of this. Think of this when you're looking at horizon. You know, I, I love to look at pictures like that. Pictures of the sunset or the sunrise, especially over the water. And it does look like a bit of a circle sometimes. You, know, you can almost see it. If you're really far out and you're looking at the ocean, it doesn't just look like a straight line. It actually, you do kind of see a circle with things. And if you see that, it's just, it's amazing. He's like pointing out, like, he, he's the one that made the horizon. He's the one that's made all the beauty. He's the one that's made all of creation. And he's the one that made the boundary of the light and darkness. Like, where does the darkness come to? Where does the light come to? When does the day come? When does the night come? All these things belong to God. Even the, the face of the moon and, uh, and uh, all these things. And it points out how great God is. And I wrote at the top, head knowledge that does not lead to heart worship only leads to pride. Because as we study this and we look at this and we start to think of science ourselves and different things and these wonders, we can easily get caught up with this. That head knowledge that does not lead to heart worship will only lead to pride. We'll think we know something, all right? We'll be like a Richard Dawkins or something, like one of these major atheist guys that knows a lot of things about a lot of stuff, about philosophy, about science, but yet at the end of the day when he dies and takes his last breath, you know, if he doesn't know Jesus Christ, he'll be put down in this place of terrible wrath and punishment and hell. And all the stuff he knew really didn't matter one single bit. And we've got to be careful, too, that even in our Bible knowledge, you know, we can, we've can we looked at Job's friends. These guys knew their Bible. They knew God pretty good, okay? They knew the Word. They knew what they'd heard. But some of them, it didn't appear. It went down to heart. How can I say it didn't appear? We never see any of them pray. We never see any of them speak to God Himself. All they're doing is speaking about God. They're not speaking to God. In true heart worship, we have got to have the head knowledge. We learn the scriptures. We learn whatever we learn about life, science, creation, everything that God has. And it's got to go down into the heart. And it's got to worship God. And if it doesn't, it'll lead to pride. And pride goes nowhere. Okay? You're going to have a whole lot of stuff 
And you know what? You're still going to die just like the next guy dies. I heard a guy on the radio today talking, Moody Radio, and he was saying he cut out some gray hairs, and then he said, oh, not really. I'm getting gray. We all are. We're going toward that way. None of us are going backwards. We're all going toward that day and that way. And indeed we are. And if we just think we're all, we know everything and we got all this pride about us, it's not going to last long until we're going to realize that it really had nothing to it at all. Okay? A life without a relationship with God is a worthless life. If you can have the entire world, you could be, I think, that guy Bloomberg that's running for president. I heard someone say this week he has $54 billion. Can you imagine he had that much money? $54 billion. That's a, I think $1 billion is $100 million. So I don't even know 100 million times 54, you know, how big that would be. That'd be no, no, 54 billion. I heard That's this what, thing. Yeah. No, I mean 1 billion. Oh, I thought it was 100 million. Maybe not. I don't know. But it's a lot of money, okay? <laughs> Tremendous amount of money. Okay. And think if you had all that, you are no richer than the man who is poor, has nothing at all, and has Jesus Christ in his heart. He's richer than that guy right there with 54 billion dollars. Because when that guy dies, he's got nothing. If that's where his pride and his trust and everything are in. When the guy dies, it's poor, that has got absolutely nothing. He has got everything in the world the world can ever imagine. He has all of eternity. He has eternal life. That's what he has. It's not death, but eternal life after death. And this is where we have to look at things. Head knowledge doesn't lead to heart worship. will only lead to pride. So as we get to studying the Bible and stuff... We should be like a guy like Job, whose theology changes, okay? I really, I, I call myself a reformer. I love John Calvin. I love Martin Luther. I like Zwingli. I like, uh, I like uh, Huss. I like all those guys you read about that truly went back to the Bible and broke away from what the church was saying and the bondage and trying to pay for people's salvation out of purgatory, even making up lies up that purgatory even exists, and all those things. And they broke away from it. But I like to think of myself as a reformer who's still reforming. Because they didn't know everything, just like we don't know everything. Just like the folks back in Job's they didn't know everything. we got to keep growing, we got to keep learning. But as I say that, I have to say it with the careful, careful shelter, so you don't become an emerging church or deconstructionist, that this is the authority. There is nothing outside of this that I'm willing to go, okay? I'll, I'll listen to what somebody says it's outside of this, and what do I do? Then I bring it back to this, and I filter it back to this, and I think, well, this is where that person misses it. This is where they're wrong, because this is not wrong. This is the authoritative Word of God. This is the anchor. You know, if someone says they wish God would speak to them, you could just open up your Bible and start reading it out loud, because those are the audible words of God, and you speak these words of God out loud and we got to be careful so as i do say we need to have a, a theology that continues to grow we should be like job where we start at one point and we go later we got to make sure we're careful that i saw a facebook meme and it showed a picture it said it said what 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 i you know the theology if we look back at the theology we had when we were first saved we'd have this face like <laughs> you know when we first started the journey of god because we may have had some bad theology, like, oh my gosh, I can't believe I believe that, and I look that way, all right? We should continue to grow and to search and to seek God, but we got to make sure that it's anchored in the Word. If we lose the Word, we've lost God. We've lost the right way, okay? If we're truly saved, I believe God's the one that saves us in the first place, God will bring us back. But why waste so much of our time and our life away from God? we got to stay anchored to the Word of God. But this is what uh, Job is picturing. He's letting them see these things. There's great things that we don't understand as people. The pillars of heaven tremble and are amazed at his rebuke. He quieted the sea with his power, and by his understanding he shattered Rahab. Now this is not the Rahab that happens later in the Bible, in the book of uh, Joshua. You know, that's the prostitute that helps them to sneak in to make the walls of Jericho fall down. This is not that Rahab, okay? This was written in the time of Abraham, way before that, they even knew about that Rahab. This is the same Rahab that would be connected to uh, Isaiah 27.1. And I did put that verse in here, we're going to come across it soon. 
But this would be the Leviathan. This would be Satan. This would be the evil one, okay? This is what this is talking about. And when it says the pillars of heaven tremble, if we go back to the mythology and how people understood science things those days, possibly it meant that the, the pillars, that what held everything up, they believed there were like pillars that held up the earth. I don't know where they were found of that, as they were just floating in the space. But the pillars of heaven tremble and are amazed at his rebuke. That God himself, all these great things we see, the earth, the sun, everything we see, he can shake it out of place. He can destroy and change everything. It's just his words. And indeed, when we read the book of Revelation, he does just that. You know, when you read the book of Revelation, it's like Chicken Little, the sky is falling down. It surely will be falling down one day. But if you're a believer today, you won't be here suffering underneath that. You'll see it all, because you'll be in glory with Him. But all those things are going to happen one day. It'll all be by His power, and He has this kind of power. He can quiet the sea. It can go from a tidal wave and tsunamis to just a crystal calm sea. It's just God's will. We looked at when Jesus, what He did when He was walking on the waters, or when he was sleeping in the boat, and, and everything was all so worrisome, and he was sleeping, everybody else was terrified, and they woke him up, and he goes, you know, why are you all upset? And boom, the waters are all quiet and still, because that is what the power of God can do. And the pillars of heaven could also be pictured at as mountains, you know, when they look at giant mountains. We don't have many mountains here in Ohio, but if you venture out of Ohio and go to Colorado, or you go to, the, to Switzerland, or you go to some places in Germany, you go to different places, you'll see some mountains that are so giant that most of the time you can't even see the top of the mountain because the clouds cover them up so much. And it shows that God can just drop those mountains, that that's the kind of power that God has. He's picturing, helping them understand how big God is. His mountains are even shaken by God. Even the powers that are stronger than creation are overpowered by God. Think about the Bible story where one day... When they were at battle, that God stops the sun from moving, stops the earth from moving, and it said it was the longest day that ever was. So it went for like 24 hours of sunlight so that they could finish the battle that they were fighting. God has the power to control that. Think about Hezekiah. Is it Hezekiah? I believe Hezekiah. Hezekiah, the king that was about to die, and he repented and he pleaded with the Lord, and they said, God said to the prophet, you got 15 more years to live. And he said, I don't believe it. I need a sign. And, and he said, what sign do you want? And he goes, I don't want the sundial to send it forward the natural way. I want it to go backwards. And it did. It went backwards to show him the sign. Now, how would that happen? Think about the earth going, <laughs> spin in the other direction. I mean, think about the tremendous power and things that God has. That just at some guy's prayer, he can change the world right there for a moment, to show something, or to be something like that. God is not constrained to His creation. God is above His creation. God is above everything, because God is the one that made it all. So it says, By His breath the heavens are cleared, His hand has pierced the fleeing serpent. And so we see that in all these pictures that we just went through, we saw chaos, okay? We saw tremendous chaos, and we see that God is firmly in control of the chaos, and we also see God pictured as the divine warrior. Okay, I was in the army, and I'm definitely not a pacifist, okay? Not a pacifist at all. And I don't think the Bible shows any pacifism. In fact, I don't know if I just didn't go a few verses farther or something. Maybe it's in the first few verses of Judges 3. But I saw it as I was studying for Judges, is that God purposely left people in the nation of Israel so they could keep having war. Because he said, I need to make sure that the people that grow up, their children, have hands trained for war. And if there's no enemy, they're not going to be able to have hands trained for war. And I thought, man, to a pacifist, that must be a verse they just wish didn't exist anymore. That God kept people so that war would continually go on, so that they could continually fight like a warrior. And then we see verses like this, where God is a warrior. God piercing the serpent. You know, God doing these kind of things. You even see... You even see in the book of Joshua, you know, when they're coming to the book of Joshua, they see Jesus Christ, and he's dressed up like a great warrior. And they're like, whose side are you on? And he's like, I'm on nobody's side, okay? Because he's God, and he stands above it all. He doesn't serve any man. He doesn't serve any way. He is God himself. Unfortunately, he was on 
their side because he fought, he did all those things. If you read, I just read it in the, our daily Bible readings recently in Isaiah, when, when uh, it was in Hezekiah's time as well, and when the king Sennacherib, who was the great Assyrian king, was telling them all, hey, I've been through all these other countries, and their religions didn't help them a bit. Their gods didn't help them a bit. Why do you think your God would help you? You know, look at what happened. He was using human logic, human philosophy, human thinking, things that we would get in our textbooks in our schools today, is what Sinatra was using on them. He's like, hey, look at my great military power. Look how I've taken over everything. Why would you think you're any different? And you know what they do? They pray to God, they repent, and it says the angel of the Lord, which often we see the angel of the Lord as Jesus himself, shows up and kills 185,000 of Sennacherib's army that night. One angel. Imagine the power with that. I mean, this is tremendous. 185,000 dead warriors in one night. And then you know what he did? Because he told, he told him too, he said, don't even worry, he won't even be around. He had, he had Sennacherib's own kids kill him that night. So he ran for his life, and then his own children killed him that night. And you can see the power of God. It doesn't, it's not limited. It's not stoppable. It's not within a human mind or a human picture or some fictional made-up story. God is above it all. And he handles all these things. And he is the divine warrior for sure. You know, so many people, we have this picture of Jesus, but he's he comes from Europe from like maybe the Middle Ages or something, and it's this wimpy looking white fellow who you know, with long hair, and everybody thinks this is Jesus. Jesus probably doesn't look anything like that picture, okay? This is some somebody pictured Jesus as, all right? We, if we really think Jesus, I, we probably would think, if we read all these stories, we see some giant, burly, mean-looking fellow <laughs> that's got tons of strength to him, all right? Because we see the pictures of what God is and who he is as well, okay? Indeed, he has a side. That is extremely merciful, extremely tender, extremely loving. But he also has a side that is very angry, wrathful, and, and tremendous. He's the creator of hell himself too. Hell didn't like, there's never a time of dualism. It's never like the cartoons where the devil's on one side, the angel's on the other side, and they're telling you what to do. God made that devil. God owns that devil. God uses the devil to his purposes and all the demons. It's all God's creation. It's all God's world. If we read Isaiah 27, 1, I'm talking about this serpent. It says, In that day the Lord will punish Leviathan, the fleeing serpent, with his fierce and great mighty sword, even Leviathan, the twisted serpent, and he will kill the dragon who lives in the sea. So likely the same Leviathan, the same, the same serpent that we're talking about in Job, is the same one that was being talked about in Isaiah. Likely it's the same one that's talked about in the book of Revelation. You know, when it calls the devil the great dragon and what's going to happen and what Jesus is going to do to this great dragon. And we can see God reigns supreme. Evil is defeated. Peace is ensured. None of these qualities existed in a single God in those days. When we go back to their mythology and their time, they had like one God who had the brains, another God who had the brawn. They didn't have any God who had everything. They had many gods and they all had functions. This is something that would have been totally different in those days as well that in one single god is a god who knows everything who created everything who, who's got the wisdom of all wisdom you can imagine and also a god who has the brawn of all brawn that can kill the most evil creature on the earth you know that can change all these things that can stop all this stuff that is all in our one single god it says but Behold, these are the fringes of his ways, and how faint a word we hear of him. But his mighty thunder, who can understand? And he's, he's pointing out, he's saying, we look at all these things with nature, creation, and what we know, and yet this is just like a whisper of God's power. We're not even getting the full power. We're not seeing the full glory. We're not even touching into it is how incredible God is. He says, just but a faint word is all we've heard of him. And it says, but then his mighty thunder, like we hear the thunders crash and boom. And it says, who can understand it? And the truth is, no one can understand it. We don't understand it today. There's things that we don't know today. I tell you, I was once thinking about becoming a pharmacist. I had all these different ideas in my head. And I took a biology class. And I loved this biology class because this lady who was a PhD biologist, her name was Dr. Lucas. 
she taught us about evolution and all these different things and how it all works with science. And she would always say, but how this gets to here in the cell and how this happens is the million dollar question. If you were to figure this out, you'd be a multimillionaire because everyone's trying to figure out these questions. And it was loaded with those questions all over evolution and science, loaded with million dollar questions that we don't understand. We get little pieces and parts, but there's a whole lot we don't know. And she told us at the end of the class, you know, this lady who is a PhD, a biologist, professional, she said, you know what, I've taught you evolution, taught you all these things, and I don't believe one single bit of it. Not one bit. And I was like, whoa! And I was studying so hard, doing all my stuff, I thought this lady was as devoted as it could be to these things. She knew it. She knew the top science things. But she said she believes what the Word of God says. She believes He's the Creator. He's the one that sustains us. She believes all those million dollar questions, how this part moves there, that goes there. She goes, it's because God is doing all these things. Because He is behind all this stuff. And she told us that, and I thought, what a beautiful witness. And it was supposed to be a Baptist affiliate college. It was Canterbury University, which I don't would never recommend to anybody if they're going there and looking for a Christian college. But this lady, she was. She had to believe a thing, and it was such a powerful witness for her to tell everybody that. And all these people studying and learning, you know, wanted to go on to be doctors or whatever in the medical path, taking this, this biology course, and uh, it was powerful. But indeed, no one can understand. There's things we, we, does that mean we should stop trying? No. It's wonderful and fascinating to understand science, understand creation, understand everything about God. But can anybody say, I've got it all? No, none of us can say that. We can say some things with surety. We can say that Jesus Christ is Lord as, and Savior. We can say that. We can say that with surety, because we can know that, because we're saved and the Spirit bears witness by our spirit. There's some things we can know for sure, but there's some things that we're going to try and try and try that's going to be hard for us. So here, 1 Corinthians 13, 12, it says, For now we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then I will know fully, just as I also have been fully known. I don't usually use the message because I don't like the message. The message isn't a scholarly translation. It's just some guy's best that he could do. You know, it'd be like me trying to make a translation of the Bible, and I don't have Hebrew and Greek and all those things on such an incredibly life-learned scholarly level. That's the way the message is. But I believe the message says it's like looking through the bottom of a Coke bottle. All right, and I always kind of like that, thinking about it, because it does seem like this. So when you think about how we look at life and different things and how we try to understand stuff, for right now on this side of heaven, if you ever, some of you people may be too young for a Coke bottle. Some of you guys for sure older than me know what the old Coke bottles are like. All right, and if you were to try to look through the bottom of it, it's like looking through a kaleidoscope. It's like you can't hardly see anything, all right? I mean, there's light and stuff that'll come through, but for images or clarity, it would be very hard. And the Bible tells us that right now, it's like we're looking through it dimly. But when we die, we'll see it face to face. It'll be clear as clear can be. Right now, we only know in part, but then we will know fully, just as I also have been fully known. So that's, this, is, this is the way... I think uh, Job might have cited this verse to them, if, you know, it would have been farther in the future right there. But this is how Job, Job pictured it to him. And I have two slides here. And the question to you, is the Bible your source of truth and authority? You've got to ask yourself that. Do I confront the unbiblical counsel of others? When other people say some stuff that's not biblical, do you confront it? Do you speak up? Do you say anything? Do you question them? Do I testify to the greatness of God to others? You know, do you talk about how great God is? You know, you should. We're called to witness and to share the gospel. Do I regularly testify to God's greatness over heaven and earth? You know, that He is the Creator. He's the one that made everything. And then a few more words here. There is much more to God than our perception. You know, even every day as I read the Bible, I read the Bible through every single year. And, and one thing I heard, maybe, I don't know if I told you this last week, but I listened to a book called The Legacy of Luther, an audio book by Stephen Nichols, and he talked a lot about Martin Luther, and Martin Luther had a habit that he read the Bible all the way through twice a year, every year, two times all the way through, and he said why he did that when people asked, because he wants to shake every little branch that's in the Bible, every little twig, and he wants to see what fruits on that little twig, what will come off of that little twig. 
And I thought, what a beautiful picture to understand how important it is for us to read our Bible, to dig deep in the scriptures, and to shake every little branch, to shake every little verse, and be like, what does this verse mean? What does this chapter say? How does this connect with something else? Isn't that a beautiful picture you had? I'd say Martin Luther had a lot of great things. All right? But indeed, as I keep reading the Bible, I keep performing. I keep learning more. I keep growing more. Because that's what God wants for all of us to do. I thoroughly believe it. And it'll help us in this life, too. Instead of finding fault with God, Job recognizes that much of what God does has to be left in the realm of mystery. Because humans can understand only a portion of God's ways. Humans cannot always comprehend what is happening or why it is happening. But they can trust in God, who is always in charge. For Job and for us, it all comes back to faith in the God who knows all and who controls all in his world. And it really does. We've got to trust God. We thoroughly got to trust Him, okay? We can easily get caught off. I've been caught off many a time where, you know, you get to doing things in the world and you get so earthly that you forget that you're just a maggot. <laughs> Remember, this is how it all got started. The chapter before it, Job was called a maggot and the son of a worm. You might forget your position and the greatness of it all and who you really are and forget who God is. I'll tell you... What usually wakes people up with that is when they have some kind of terminal disease or they're dying. Then they're really thinking, what is about to happen? Where is God? And you think, what about all those years that they missed, okay? And it's easy for all of us to get away from suffering and to just fall into some relaxed type of mode. But when we're suffering, we do tend to lean in on God and to trust Him and know that we are very vulnerable, that we are helpless, and we are completely dependent upon Him. And how much better is it if we live our whole life living just like that. And I wrote at the top, do you absolutely trust Jesus? Do you have faith in the God that hangs the earth on nothing? And truly the earth does hang on nothing, okay? There is no any supports. We've seen pictures from outer space. It's a spinning ball that happens to continually go around the sun and just keeps spinning and spinning and spinning. What makes it spin? What makes it to stay in the orbit it stays in? I, I read a book, I Don't Have Enough Faith to Be an Atheist by Norma Geisler once. And he pointed out that there's over 100 elements that if there's 100 zeros after the decimal point before the one, and that if any one of those 100 elements were to be different, we would all die. There'd be no more life. We would no longer exist. The planet would not exist. Everything. And this was just from what the little bit of science that we found so far when he wrote the book pointed out. And how fragile life is. How amazing it is. We are where we are. The earth is where it is. You can really look at creation and see the greatness of God, and it should cause us to stand in awe and awesome wonder at this God who created it all. And yet we can know him personally through Jesus Christ because he sent his son to the earth. People say, well, why doesn't God tell us who he is then? God sent his own son to the earth and had him killed. Let us kill him and hate him, and put him on a cross, and then rose him up from the dead again, and people will say, why doesn't God tell us? He gave us a book, a book that outstands every single other religion's books. There's not one single holy book of all the holy books you find that has this kind of establishment as the Bible has, okay? Hindus claim to be around for 70,000 years. You know what? None of their writing has been around for more than a few thousand years that they can provide or prove to us or show anything of. All right, all these other books we have, you have like mostly like uh, traditions or legends or things. We have something like 24,000 copies of the Bible from 100 BC to the first few centuries, still today in existence. None of the other ones, I mean, it starts coming close after that, like 10 copies of such an old book. I mean, it is tremendous what we have here, and yet people will say, well, why doesn't this guy show us who he is? Why don't we see this? We have it all, but people refuse to take it. They refuse to accept it. Why? Because they hate God, and they don't want anything to do with a God who is a holy God who demands their allegiance. I saw one thing, a debate right now going on with some theology stuff is, does the word faith equal allegiance? And I thought, wow, that's an interesting thing there. Does the word faith equal allegiance? You know, we say we have to have faith in God. We have to have allegiance to God. And I know that's, I'd like to look into it more and see, you know, what's going on with this debate that people are talking about in some modern theological circles here. I'm not trying to change what the Word says, but just trying to understand it better. 
But with that, I have some 